Well, the Lord be with you. You know, I really am starting to rethink this whole preaching after the singing business. Because, uh, man, didn't Levi do, wasn't that awesome? Good night. Now I got to stand up here and you got to listen to my voice. My gracious. I do not envy you whatsoever. <laughs> um, but this morning we'll be looking uh, in Holy Scripture at 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. We'll read verses 10 through 12 there. And then we're going to be in chapter 3. Uh, verses 3 through 14. <coughs> Excuse me. 1 Kings chapter 2, beginning with verse 10, reading through 12, then on to chapter 3. Still hear some folks turn. It's in the front half. I had to remind myself of that once. 1 Kings chapter 2, beginning with verse 10. Then David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his kingdom was firmly established. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David. Only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. For if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we come now to hear from your word, may it speak to us in the pages of this book. May it change us. May it change us more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we now pray. Amen. There is an old African proverb about a spider named Anasi. Anasi is the Anak word in the African language for, guess what, spider. And so Anasi one day was given by the sky god Noai the pot that contained all the wisdom in the world. And Anasi would take this pot and regularly, every day, open the lid and look down into the pot and each day gain a new skill, a new insight, deeper knowledge into the ways of the world. But Anasi was a greedy, selfish spider. And so Anasi decided that rather than sharing this knowledge, this wisdom with the world, that he would hide it. And so the spider decided to hide this pot in the tallest tree he could find. And so when Anasi found the tree, he did what any spider would do, right? He grabbed the pot with his front two legs 
and then with his remaining six began to try to climb this tall tree, but something happened. Turns out the spider Anasi and I have something in common. His gut got in the way. And so as he tried to climb the tree, the pot would hit him in the belly, and finally he had almost decided to give up when his youngest son was sitting some way off, came to his father and said, Daddy, tie the pot to your back and climb the tree. And so when Nasi did, he found a great strong rope and tied the pot to his back and scurried up the tree. But by the time he reached the top, he was angry. He was angry because here he was with all the wisdom in the world, and yet it took a child to tell him how to hide it, how to get to the top of a tree. So Anasi, in his anger, threw the pot from the top of the tree, and it burst on the ground, and all the wisdom of the world went with it, and it spread far and wide as people took it and shared it with one another. I like that little folk tale because it, it, it's a way to explain, well, how in the world did wisdom come to be? But I like it more. I like it more because it speaks to the danger of wisdom when it is used only for oneself. Now, you can't say the word wisdom in a, bunch of, in a room full of folks who've at least heard of the Bible and not hear about Solomon. In fact, this story we've read this morning from, from 1 Kings is sort of the introduction to Solomon as king. That little excerpt from chapter 2 just tells us how he became king. David died, and so Solomon, and we skip the bloody stuff, becomes king. He's the, the offspring of David and Bathsheba. And when Solomon becomes king, he has this dream where he's visited by God, and God says... What do you want? What do you want me to give you? That's a loaded question, isn't it? I mean, imagine if God visited you in a dream. What would you want me to give you? Now, we all have our Sunday school answers, right? World peace, everybody to get along, unity. But ask, answer really. What would you really want God to give you? I mean, I've always liked a 1970 Chevelle Supersport, but I don't know. May not, God may not be a Chevy man. I don't know. Solomon is visited by God, and Solomon says, there's a lot of people I have to govern. I'm a child. He's the first, mona- he's the first dynastic ruler. Before David was Saul, they weren't kin, and now Solomon, David's son, I don't know how to do this. This is all new. He asks for wisdom. And as the story goes, God gives Solomon wisdom. And from this point on, Solomon's known, uh, at least legendarily, as the smartest man who's ever lived. The wisest man who's ever lived. In fact, 1 Kings, the writer of 1 Kings, the the Deuteronomistic historian, gets right to the point to try to tell us how wise Solomon is. The next story in chapter 3 is probably one of the most familiar of Solomon's sort of wisdom legends. Two women come to Solomon with a baby. Both claim to be the child's mother. And Solomon says, well, I'll know how we'll solve this. Cut the baby in half. Just get a sword, cut the baby in half. Give half to one woman, half to the other. There, it's solved. And one woman says, works for me. Don't think she knew how babies worked. The other woman says, no, give her the child. I would rather see it live than die. And Solomon says, well, that's the mama. Another one, it comes from the Quran and some other Persian traditions about Solomon when the the queen of Sheba came to test Solomon. It's one of my favorites, actually. The queen of Sheba came and decided to test the wisdom of Solomon. And so she sent out all these flowers in front of him but one of them was false. She had made a a fake flower and wanted the king to use his wisdom to determine which one was the fake one. She even made it smell like the others. But Solomon didn't go over to examine the flowers. Do you know what he does? He walks over and opens the window and lets the bees inside. And the bees go to all the flowers 
except the false one. I mean, from this point on, Solomon is seen as an extremely wise man, yeah? I mean, we ought to emulate Solomon, yeah? Mm, no. We sometimes forget the, the other side, right? We forget to turn the mat over to see all the bugs sticking to it. Solomon asked God for wisdom. God gives Solomon wisdom. And yeah, he does stuff like keeps babies from being cut in half and giving them to the right mama. But he does some other stuff too. In fact, we hear about it even before he prays for wisdom. He sacrifices, offers incense at the high places. Some even a thousand times. You know what a high place is? It ain't the temple. It's not the tabernacle. A high place. In, in Solomon's day, that's the one thing you did not do. Offering sacrifices in high places? You mean where they offer sacrifices to, to Asherah, the moon god Sin? Where they offer sacrifices to the likes of Marduk and Baal and El? Yeah, that's what Solomon did. And more than anybody else. So it wasn't perfect. But what's more, what really arrests me about Solomon, if you want to turn a page or two over, it comes in chapter 5. If there's any sort of uh, refrain for the people of Israel, particularly at the time of the monarchy, it's this, that, that you were once enslaved and God liberated you from your slavery. And so Solomon, as you probably know, after his father David had wanted to build the temple, God said to David, no, and gave the opportunity to Solomon. And in chapter 5, we hear about how Solomon prepares the material for the temple. But then in verse 13, you can read past it and never notice it unless you're looking for it. In verse 13, it says, King Solomon conscripted forced labor out of all Israel. The temple to the God of liberation was built by slaves. Solomon, who like his father before him and like the judges and prophets before him, were constantly reminded by God to tell the people, out of slavery you came. And what happens? Out of slave, into slavery they go to build Solomon's temple. So what happens? I mean, if Solomon is, is this man, the wisest man who ever lived, how do we get to this place? Well, I think, I think that's where we learn the lesson of Anasi, that old African folktale. Solomon wanted wisdom to discern right from wrong, to rule his people, yes. But eventually, Solomon used that wisdom not only to conscript his own brothers and sisters to forced labor, but to marry foreign wives, to bring in false gods and idols into Jerusalem for the sake of power and for the sake of wealth. And that's why, by the time of the New Testament, the wisdom tradition comes at us from another angle. If you look over in 1 Corinthians, Paul corrects the course just a bit in 1 Corinthians, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> oh, sorry, oh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul corrects the course. Paul says, look, wisdom, wisdom is not all about knowing, it's not about diplomas, it's not about age, it's not about knowing right from wrong. This is what wisdom is. The message about the cross is foolishness, he says, to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Why? Because the wisdom of the wise eventually leads someone to conscript their own brothers and sisters to forced labor. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has, God not, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. 
Solomon prayed for wisdom. Solomon asked for wisdom from God, and God gave to Solomon wisdom. And what did he do with it? What did he do with the wisdom that God gave him? Enslaved his brothers and sisters. Worshipped idols at the high places. Broke the covenant with God. It's why after Solomon, before his death, the kingdom divides and has never come back together since. And so, when Paul writes to his fellow believers, he says, listen, wisdom is not what you think. Wisdom's not about knowing right from wrong. Wisdom's not about knowing all the new skills and all the insights into the world. Wisdom is the cross. Wisdom comes when laying your life down for the sake of someone else. Wisdom comes when God leaves the glory of heaven not to come down and set us all straight, but to die to show us that this, this foolishness in the eyes of others, this is wisdom. To put yourself so far down the list that you are willing to die. It's not about holding on to it to develop it into power, but of letting it go. Because it is foolish to die for someone. It is foolish to forgive someone 70 times, seven times. It is foolish to give and give and give and know someone is taking advantage of you. It is foolish to die for those who in your mind may not be worth dying for. But that is the wisdom of God. And it is the wisdom we celebrate today, not only in the waters of baptism, but in the bread and cup of this table. The wisdom of God to be broken and poured out for all of God's people. And so this morning, as we come to the table, may you prepare your heart to receive the wisdom of God, to set aside whatever it is in your own heart that that keeps you from your neighbor, keeps you from one another, that keeps you from the table and communing with Christ Jesus. Take this time now to pray for God's Spirit to come. In a moment, we will be served from His table. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, you have shown us, Lord, what true wisdom is. That wisdom does not come in our gaining of knowledge, does not come in our power, but Lord, true wisdom comes in laying down our lives for one another, for giving ourselves up for the sake of the other. And Lord, is not that what, that, that what this meal is all about. That yes, Lord, we'll take a, a bit of bread and a little juice from a cup. And God, if that's all that it is for us, or it may it just be that. But Lord, if we hear your spirit, if we claim to follow you, if we call on your name, as we come to this table and as we are served this bread and this cup, may it be a reminder to us, God, of your broken body, of your shed blood upon the cross, which is foolishness to this world, but wisdom to those of us who believe. So now, God, Take from us whatever it is that keeps us from this table, that keeps us from you, that keeps us from one another, so that we may come and be fed by your hand. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.